Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Amadeus H1 2024 Results Conference Call. At this time, all lines are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If at any time during this call you require immediate assistance, please press star zero for the operator. I would now like to turn the conference over to Luis Maroto, President and CEO. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and welcome to our 24 first half results presentation. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by our business heads, Desius Palmorbida and Paco Perez Lozao. I will start today's presentation with a general overview of our most important developments. Desius and Paco will cover the business reviews for our segments. I will end by reviewing the key financial aspects. Our CFO executive search progress process is progressing well. We'll provide you with a more detailed update as soon as possible. Before we get started, I would like to thank you for your participation at our recent Investor Day in London. Over the years, we have debated Amadeus many times. And yet again, we had a highly productive and in-depth discussion on our business and growth opportunities. We look forward to delivering on our commitments in the years to come. This time to slide forward for an overview of our results. 24 kick off strongly for Amadeus, and this evolution has continued into the second quarter, where we continue to see double-digit growth rates as well as EBITDA and EBIT margin expansion. In the first half of the year, Amadeus Group revenue increased by 13%, EBITDA grew 15%, EBIT grew by 19%, and adjusted profit expanded by 22%. The financial performance over the first half supported robust free cash flow generation of 530 million, resulting in net financial debt of 2.6 billion at June 13, 24, representing one uh, 15 times last 12 month EDA. This strong evolution in the first half of the year is in line with our expectations and we confirm our outlook for 24. Our results have been supported by positive development at their distribution, RIT solutions and hospitality and other solutions, which we will review shortly. We continue to advance well on our strategies across Amadeus as we build for the future. In RIT, we are leading the way for the Erlan retailing transformation with our next generation Erlan IT product suite, Nibio. Amadeus Nebio is a traveler-centric retailing platform offering next generation retailing capabilities to the airlines, including what Gion offers and orders, backed by fully flexible, future-proof cloud-native solutions and the latest advances in AI. It's an industry evolution that will require years of focus and dedication, but we are well positioned to drive this transformation and to support the industry's transitions. We have three contracted customers to date, Finner, Saudi and British Airways, and we expect to continue to expand this list. At the back of British Airways, Nebio announcements last quarter, we are pleased to announce this quarter that uh, British Airways will, in addition, implement Amadeus Network Revenue Management. The airline retailing transformation will further drive NDC penetration. We believe we have the most advanced NDC technology in the industry and that we will play a key role in scaling NDC adoption. We are advancing to make NDC possible at scale through the GDS. We have 60 NDC airline agreements signed. We represent half of the bookable inventory in our system and 27 implemented to date. As the NDC content made available through our platform increases, we believe we will be capturing more and more NDC bookings in the future. Our goal is to become the undisputed NDC aggregator for airlines and travel agencies. In hospitality, we were very pleased to announce that Accor, a world-leading hospitality group, will implement Amadeus market-leading cloud-based central reservation system for its extensive portfolio of properties globally. Desius and Paco will now run us through the key developments at each of our reported segments. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Desius. We now turn to slide five. Happy to be speaking to you again. And uh, we start uh, with the air distribution commercial highlights. So during the first half of 24, we signed 32 contracts, both uh, new contracts and renewal agreements, further strengthening our content offering to travel sellers. As Luis was saying, we're advancing well on our NDC strategy. We see the adoption of NDC in our distribution business gain traction gradually, 
and by doing so, we believe that Amadeus will continue to strengthen its position as the leading enabler of indirect airline distribution. Canadian WestJet has been the latest airline to sign an NDT agreement with Amadeus. And also in the second quarter, we had uh, Tunisair, Eva Air, and Vueling's NDC content that have been made available on the Amadeus travel platform. On the travel agency side, the eTravelI Group, a leading global technology provider for flights, they're powering Booking.com and have brands such as MyTrip, GoToGate, and Flight Network. They have chosen Amadeus as its primary NDC content provider. In addition, a selection of eTravelize group content, including its virtual interline content through its subsidiary TripStack, will be made available on Amadeus' travel platform. Moving to the corporate side, we have now Amadeus NDC offering will now be available to Concourse Travel uh, online booking tool. And finally, we continue to increase the number of corporations signing with Citrix Solutions. International Hotel Group Hotels and resort, Resorts will be a customer of Citrix Travel. And we have also signed an expansion of our partnership with FCM Travel, adding Citrix Easy to its portfolio of solutions. Now moving to the volume evolution. In the first half of 24, Amadeus bookings grew by 2.9% versus the first half of 2023, supporting the revenue growth of 10.7%. In 2024, as expected, we have seen a normalization in our booking growth evolution compared to the evolution in 2023, which benefited from air traffic recovery. In North America, our bookings continue to be impacted by volumes channeled through direct connections between one very large online travel agency and a few large carriers in North America, impacting our local bookings in the region, although having a marginal revenue growth impact as it relates to low-fee local bookings. Our bookings were also impacted by the bankruptcy in the second quarter of a large European tour operator, FTI Group. So excluding the FTI Group tour operator bankruptcy, the holiday effects, and the NORAM local booking effect, we estimate our booking growth in the second quarter at 7.4% and 7.8% in the first half versus prior year. Over the six-month period, Western Europe and North America were our largest regions, and Asia-Pacific was our best-performing region, expanding 25.1%. For our expected Q3 and Q4 volume evolution, we saw some comparison versus 2023. We expect the volume growth in Q3 2024 to be softer than Q2 2024. The volume growth in Q4 2024 will be stronger than in Q2 2024. So the reason for that is that in Q3 last year, we have had a, a very strong recovery in August. And then in Q4, we had a concentration of effects uh, that one will lap, which is uh, the NORAM local booking effect, and uh, a one-off effect, which was the crisis in the Middle East, where we had a spike in cancellations. With that, let's move to slide six for airline IT solutions. I'll start again with the commercial highlights, which is during the second quarter, several of our customers have decided to expand their airline IT solutions relationship with us. We're very pleased to announce that British Airways, a recent Navio customer, signed for Amadeus Network Revenue Management module. In a joint solution center, our teams will collaboratively evolve network revenue management features and co-design new revenue management capabilities to optimize commercial decision-making. We had several other upsells in airline IT with customers such as Thai Airways, Thai Airways Jeju Air, Air Austro, Air Cairo, and Eva Air acquiring and expanding modules with us. Regarding airport IT, during the second quarter, we continue to expand our customer base, and we had several upsells from our airport IT offering. We signed with Malaysian, Malaysia Airports to deliver our airport passenger processing solutions to six, air, six airports in Malaysia, and we had other signatures in the quarter, 
including Brisbane airports, Avinor, which operates Norway's 44 state owned uh, airports, Menzies Aviation, Sun Pit Clearwater International Airport, and Pittsburgh International Airport. So now we move to passenger boarded volumes. So in the consolidated first half of 2024, Amadeus passengers boarded increased by 14% relative to the first half of 2023, driven by an organic PB growth of 12% on the back of global air traffic growth in the period, added to, I'm sorry, I lost my thought over here, driven by the organic growth of 12% on the back of global air traffic growth in the period. Our organic growth was complemented by a net positive effect resulting from customer implementations, primarily Etihad Airways, ITA Airways, Hawaiian Airways, Bamboo Airways, and Allegiant Air, all of them implemented in 2023, and Vietnam Airlines in the second quarter of 2024. In the second quarter of 24, passengers boarded expanded by 12%, driven by an organic growth of 10%, and the net positive non-organic effects from customer implementations. Amadeus PB organic growth softened in the second quarter relative to the first quarter as air traffic growth advances through the recovery curve and trends towards normalization. And with that, I now pass to Paco for the hospitality segment date. Yes, thank you, Odysseus. Good afternoon. So this is Paco, and I'm very pleased to be here. Please turn to slide seven for an update on our host segment. Our hospitality and other solutions revenue grew by 13% in the first half of 24. Both hospitality, which generates the majority of the revenues in this segment, and payments had a strong evolution and delivered double-digit growth versus the prior year. On hospitality, we were pleased to announce in the second quarter that Accor, a world-leading hospitality group, will implement Amadeus market-leading cloud-based central reservation system for its extensive portfolio of properties globally. Also, Amadeus has incorporated generative artificial intelligence, GenAI, into an innovative new chatbot for its business intelligence suite, starting with our product called Agency 360 Plus. The Amadeus Advisor chatbot, powered by Microsoft's Azure OpenAI service, builds on the strategic partnership between the two technology companies to foster collaboration and innovation across the entire travel industry. Moving to payments, we had new signatures, such as with Thai Airways, which contracted for the exchange payment platform from Outpace, and Wakano Group, one of Africa's largest travel sellers, which established a new partnership with Outpace for virtual payments with a B2B wallet. Also, we have partnered with eTravelI Group to allow airlines and other travel stakeholders using Outpace's exchange payment platform to benefit from eTravelize Group's risk management solution called Precision. And with that, I pass back to Luis. Thanks, Paco. Uh, let's go to slide nine uh, to review our revenue evolution. Our group revenue grew 13.4%, supported by double-digit growth across uh, our different segments. Their distribution revenue was 10.7% above prior year, primarily driven by the booking evolution, as you described, by a revenue per booking growth of 7.6%, fundamentally driven by a positive booking mix effect and pricing effects, including impacts from inflation and yearly price adjustments, contract renewals, and new agreements. With regards to RIT solutions, revenue grew by 17.6%, driven by the PB volumes evolution, coupled with a 3 2% higher revenue per PB. The increase in the revenue per PB primarily resulted from positive impacts from the inflationary or price adjustments, upselling of incremental solutions, and Altea New Skies customer mix, as well as fast growth of our airline expert services business and an increase in airport IT revenues supported by the consolidation of Vision Box. Regarding hospitality and other, revenue was 13.2% above prior year, driven by strong performances of both hospitality and payments on the back of customer implementations and volume expansion. Within hospitality, the key contributors were sales and event management, service optimization, and Amadeus CRS, 
within hotel IT, digital media and distribution revenues, backed by an increase in transactions, and business intelligence supported by customer implementations. Within payment, all its revenue lines reported a strong, a strong growth rates, also supported by the consolidation of both. Finally, we expect the hospitality segment revenue to grow faster in second half than in first half versus prior year, supported by customer implementations and increased transactions, as well as voxel revenue consolidated contribution. Let's move to slide 10 for the segment contribution and the net indirect cost uh, evolution in this uh, first half versus uh, first half of last year. Air distribution's contribution grew by 13.4, as a result of the revenue growth, as I just described, an uh, 8.2% uh, cost increase, which resulted from higher variable costs driven by the bookings evolution and other effects, such as customer and country mix, and fixed cost growth largely caused by increased resources, mainly in the development area, and a higher unitary personal cost. Contribution margin of the segment expanded by 1.2 percentage points to 48.5%. LIT solutions contribution increased by 17.9, resulting from the revenue evolution described before and cost growth of 16.7%, driven by R&D investment expansion, focus on the enhancement of our portfolio for airlines and airports, customer implementations, and our fast-growing airline expert service business, as well as the consolidation of vision box and growth in other cost lines to support the overall business expansion. LIT Solutions Contribution Margin expanded by 0.2 percentage points to 71.4%. Regarding hospitality and other solutions, contribution was 14% above prior year as a result of the revenue growth described before a higher cost by 12.7%, resulting from the higher variable costs, primarily driven by the expansion of our digital media distribution and serious hospitality businesses, as well as the strong performance of our payments B2B wallet solution. And an increase in fixed costs fundamentally caused by expanded R&D investment dedicated to the evolution of our hospitality and payment solutions portfolio and to customer implementations and other cost lines to support the overall business expansion and the consolidation of Voxel. Hospitality contribution margin rose by 0.3 percentage points to 34.2%. Finally, net indirect cost were 16.9 higher, mainly resulting from an increase in transaction processing and cloud migration cost as a result of the volume expansion and a, a progressive shift to the cloud and to a lesser extent a unitary personal cost increase. In slide 11, we uh, review our EBITDA, EBIT and profit evolution. Please note we are excluding acquisition related costs associated with Vision Box and Voxel acquisitions of 3 million in aggregate before taxes incurred in the first half of this year. In the first half of 24, our EBITDA was 15% higher and our EBITDA margin expanded by 0.6 uh, to 39.4%. Our EBITDA performance resulted from the revenue evolution I described before, a higher cost of revenue and an increase in personal and other operating expenses. Cost of revenue grew by 12.6%, resulting from air distribution variable cost growth, driven by booking growth and other factors, including customer and country mixes, as well as hospitalities, higher volumes, and payments, B2B wallet, business expansion. Cost of revenue growth in quarter two softened versus quarter one due to non-recurring and non-transaction related effects in the, in the base, with a broadly neutral impact on first half cost of revenue growth. We expect cost of revenue over revenue in the second half to be similar to the first half. Our P&L fixed costs increased by 12.2%, mainly resulted, resulting from increased resources, particularly in our development activity, to support our R&D investments coupled with a higher unitary cost and higher transaction processing and cloud migration cost. We expect these costs in the second half to be above the first half. As we stated as part of our expectation for the year, we expect our fixed cost growth in 24 to be lower than in 23, excluding the vision box and box cell consolidation impact. Below the beta line, DNA expense increased by 6.6%, mainly resulting from a higher expense from internally developed assets and depreciation from the reassessment of the useful lives of certain assets, partly offset by a lower depreciation expense from a reduction in hardware investment driven by our shift to the cloud. 
DNA expense growth is expected to decelerate in the second half relative to the first half. The increase in EBITDA coupled with our DNA expense evolution drove EBIT up by 18.6% and EBIT margin expanded by 1.2 percentage points to 28.5%. Finally, our adjusted profit grew by 22% as a result of EBIT growth and a higher net financial expenses and taxes. Slide 12, uh, we can review our R&D investment and CAPEX in the first half. R&D grew by 15.5%, focused on the evolution of our portfolio for airlines, including Nevio, our hospitality platform, enhancing our solutions for travel sellers and corporations, as well as for airports, and of our payments solution portfolio. Our migration to the cloud and our partnership with Microsoft and bespoke and the consulting services provided to our customers and customer implementations. In the first half, our CapEx increased by 15 million or 5%, mainly driven by higher software capitalizations, partly offset by 17 million collection from a sale and leaseback transaction over our data center in Erding. CapEx represented 10.6% of our revenue in the first half. We expect CapEx to grow faster in, in, uh, in the following two quarters relative to the first half evolution versus prior year. Now, finally, we review our cash flow generation and leverage. In the first half, we generated 530 million free cash flow, representing 20% versus prior year. If we exclude a non-recurring tax-related collection of 43 million from the 23 comparison base, this free cash flow growth resulted from the increase in EBITDA and improving change in working capital outflow and higher capex and taxes. We expect free cash flow in quarter three to be below prior year due to an unusually high change in working capital inflow in the uh, third quarter of uh, 2023 base and higher capex than prior year. And we expect faster capex growth in quarter three than in the first half of the year. In the last quarter, in the quarter four, we expect free cash flow to resume positive growth. Net debt amounted to 2.6 billion at the end of June, 444 million higher than at the end of December. Due to the acquisition of Treasury shares and the desert repurchase programs, the interim dividend payment and the acquisition of Vision Box and Boxel, partly offset by our free cash flow generation. Leverage amounted to 1. Uh, dot 15 times the debt to EBITDA at the end of June. Thank you. Uh, and uh, with this, we have finished the presentation and are ready to take any questions you may have. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question at this time, simply press a star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press a star two. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press a star one. Your first question comes from the line of Adam Wood with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, Luis. This is Paco. Thank you very much for taking the question. Uh, I've got two, please. The, the first one is you obviously reiterated the guidance for the year today, um, but I guess things have changed a little bit in the industry since you first gave that guide. We've had a, a number of profit warnings and, and more cautious outlooks from the airlines. Um, I, I guess normally the pricing buffer that the airlines would have would protect you because they can lower pricing um, to protect load factors. But it does seem that a number of the airlines are actually wanting to lower capacity um, rather than lower pricing to protect that pricing. Could you just talk a little bit about how you look at the market today? Um, is, is the capacity growth in the second half um, still comfortable for you to be able to hit those numbers? Or are you looking at a different mix in terms of pricing and volumes in your business to be able to get to where you've guided? Um, and then secondly, looking at the software market more generally, I think again in the first half of the year, we've seen um, you know, a meaningful um, contraction pressure on, on software spending across the world. Um, you've obviously got a very specific exposure in travel, and actually it seems that the, air company, the, air, um, the airlines and the hotels are, are willing to spend more aggressively because of the transformations that are happening. Could you just talk a little bit about how you see budgets in those industries you know, versus the pressure we're seeing elsewhere? And is that view that because of the transformations that are happening, there is budget and, and you're not seeing pressure that, that, that other software companies are seeing? Thank you. Yeah, with regards to the first question, I mean, uh, again, we are speaking to our guidance. Uh, the impact we expect to be more on the uh, deal from, uh, from some airlines based on uh, uh, the comments that have been made. Uh, I mean, still uh, the projections in terms of traffic are, are healthy uh, for the full year figures. 
Of course, we need to see how things are going to evolve. As you know, it's much more difficult to adjust capacity and pricing. It will depend, of course, on the delivery of the airlines, and there could be some adjustments here and there. Uh, but overall, even if there is some small adjustment in the total capacity, we feel uh, confident that we'll be able to, to achieve the figures that we have provided you. Of course, there may be always ups and downs compared to the uh, you know, the volumes, the pricing, uh, the different business uh, units, but after the results we have seen in the first half, uh, again, we feel confident for the rest of the year uh, based on the current, uh, our current view of the situation uh, moving forward. With regards to the software, I mean, uh, as you know, uh, the investments uh, are long-term uh, for many of these transformations. Uh, we have been signing contracts uh, with the majority of the players in the industry. Uh, we have not seen for the time being you know, a decision uh, not to continue doing so. Again, these are medium-term investments. Uh, so uh, for the time being, look, things are business as usual. Uh, again, depending on the final results of the different players, there may be some adaptation uh, moving forward, but this is not what we have seen. I, again, I have this issue with me today that meets uh, customers uh, much more often than I do. You can set this is your view. Yes, uh, for now, I think our pipeline uh, continues to be strong. We see many RFPs uh, coming out, and uh, as we're discussing here, maybe IT spend uh, can be split between what is build uh, and what is run. So uh, in terms of run, we are software as a service, so it is really related to business transactions that are happening, and they continue to happen. And then on the build side, uh, usually these are long-term investments associated to CapEx, and we continue for now with strong appetite for customers to uh, invest, modernize, uh, and see the benefits uh, of, uh, of implementing the systems. That's very helpful. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Briest with UBS. Please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. A couple from me. Just talking about the um, the, the distribution business, uh, IATA's figures for May suggest that international travel is up, um, RPKs are up uh, 19%. I think in Latin America, they're up 17%. And I'm just trying to square that with the, the volume recovery. In Latin America, I think volumes have now shrunk for five quarters. What, what's happening there and more broadly with the the expected recovery of international travel flowing into distribution. And then just looking at your regional sales, I noticed that in the US, uh, revenues dropped 10% in the first half year on year from 625 million to 565 million. Is this all related to the distribution business or, or is there something else at play there? Thank you. Yeah, maybe let's let's start with uh, the question around uh, the RPKs and uh, and their evolution. So when we analyze that uh, regarding uh, our volumes, uh, we do see, let's say, a more favorable uh, mix uh, of the Amadeus business towards global versus domestic. So that uh, we can pick up. In terms of how that translates into premium traffic and how much of that uh, can we see on the GDS. I think that has been uh, the, the historical moment uh, or the historical trend where uh, we see part of that in, uh, in our numbers and does the underlying uh, growth uh, that we have mentioned overall consolidated for the first half at 7.8 and particularly in the quarter uh, being 7.4. 7 uh, I think that now the second question yeah. regarding... No, the let, me, let me try to clarify because look, uh, what, what you are talking about in terms of revenues uh, we are, is not exactly reflecting our business. This is related to our legal entities, so it's not the full amount we bill uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, so you should refer more to the overall uh, you know details, and also we provide you with the bookings. It is true that the bookings in the U.S. Uh, I mean, you have seen a drop in the first half. Uh, we have uh, mainly updating you uh, about that, and this has to do uh, with the direct connects that we have been explaining to you uh, during the different calls. Uh, but I will not take this revenue information. It's more based on uh, you know legal entities. You know the way we do our internal transfer pricing as the main reference uh, to really conclude about the business. That's not the case. Okay, and on Latin America, I mean, why are the 
volume shrinking for so long. So in Latin America, we have a, a similar situation as we have in North America, where we have uh, direct connects that are being implemented between large airlines uh, with uh, large uh, travel agencies. Again, the impact of that uh, in volume is, uh, is visible, but in terms of revenues, uh, it, is, uh, it is not very material, as this we're talking about, uh, domestic bookings that don't impact, uh, that don't impact very much. Uh, that's why we always go back to the underlying trend. Uh, we feel that those effects will start lapping, uh, mostly as of Q4, and thus uh, our expectation of acceleration of volumes in Q4, uh, with a Q3 that is going to be softer, but a Q4 where we're going to have an acceleration. Okay, thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Sven Mert with Mark Barkley. Please go ahead. Great. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. I have a few modeling questions. So CapEx has been 10.5% of revenues in the first half, and you expect this to increase in the second half. Given the CMD guidance for a CapEx ratio of 11 to 13% with a declining trend, when should we model the peak in CapEx spent relative to revenues? And is the 13% what you expect as a base case, or is it just one possible scenario if you have lots of implementation at the same time? And then secondly, it would be helpful if you could um, comment if there, we should expect any difference in, in phasing in terms of the cost of sales between Q3 and Q4. Okay, look, uh, just uh, high level. Uh, in principle, not to the second question, but again, look, uh, at the end, it's not exact figures. There are always movements between countries, and it's based on, but based on our estimation today, should be quite similar. And in terms of CapEx, uh, again, we have provided you a guidance for the uh, three years. Uh, we also said that 24 will be higher than 25 uh, and 26. You have seen the results of the first half. So uh, as we are maintaining uh, completely our guidance, yeah, you can really make your assumptions about the, the CAPEX for the second half, but we will not be more detailed than that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Alex Irving with Bernstein. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Trends, very strong performance in the quarter, but can that continue or do you think moderate? I'm sorry, we, if you can, if you can uh, speak a bit louder, we cannot hear you. Uh, sure, is that any better? Yeah, yeah, that's much better. All right, so good afternoon. Two from me, please. First, on your revenue for booking trends, strong performance in the quarter, can that continue or is that going to moderate from here? Where does it need to get to to hit your 2026 target of a 6 to 9% revenue CAGR? Second, specifically on North America, we've seen some significant changes over the last couple of months in the way that American Airlines approached NDC incentives. But how have your conversations with US-based travel agents changed over the past since we last spoke? Has the desire to implement NDC content diminished or is that as strong as it was? Yes. So let's start with the second one, which is uh, the relationship with travel sellers in North America. I think that uh, the appetite of travel sellers to uh, implement NDC, uh, they continue. What we believe it is favorable uh, to us, it's a conversation around more uh, using our NDCX solutions than Direct Connect, because Direct Connect have an element of uh, limited possibility of scaling, uh, as you, you have reached a certain number of Direct Connects that is difficult for the travel seller. And the fact that we have signed 60 airlines uh, with NDC, and that content is going to be available with NDCX, uh, we see a good demand and good traction. Now, in terms uh, of adoption, uh, of course, uh, the less content differentiation you made uh, between the two, uh, then uh, it means that we may see less adoption of NDC uh, in North America specifically because of the change of commercial stance of American Airlines. But I find uh, that uh, is, is it's going to be a... a let's say, a, a very small impact uh, within the quarter and uh, but because the overall trend uh, is of adoption of NDC, and we're going to see that continue on the, on the quarters to come, independent of, uh, of American Airlines, because many other airlines are having NDC strategies, and that trend will continue. 
So let me take the first question. I mean, as you know, we have guided you uh, for a three years uh, CAGR of 6 to 9 percent, but we also guided you at the beginning of this year uh, with a, 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 a guidance for the distribution business of high single to low double. So uh, the answer is yes, we expect uh, to really uh, be slower the growth in distribution as we are you know, evolving towards a more normalized uh, traffic uh, in the years to come based on the projections of IAT and other sources. And therefore, yes, there will be a, a, a softener, uh, still a very healthy growth, but not at the levels that uh, we expect to see uh, during 2024. All right, thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Victor Cheng with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. A um, couple, if I may. So first of all, on, on kind of the, the bookings outlook and maybe the Q2 exit rate, um, I think you said you know, 4% year to date in, in May, and obviously June has some negative work effects and FTI bankruptcy. But, but what are we looking in terms of July? And actually, if I think about Q3, there should be some positive effects. So are you does that is that included when you say Q2 uh, Q3 will be softer versus Q2, and then if I think about Q4 as well, um, I, I think you know, like you said, you know the, the softer comps from from NARAM will mean that Q4 will reaccelerate. But if I look at consensus, that we have eight percent, so that's still quite a bit of gap. Um, and if you kind of only do three four percent in Q4, that still implies a. a, a, a sequential slowdown. Uh, how should we think about Q4 then? And, and just on that point, um, I think Turkish Airlines is, always, is starting doing GDS surcharge in, in 1st of October as well. Is that something that you're factored in when, when thinking about Q4? And I guess that will be similar to Latin where you would see kind of uh, 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 four quarters of, of uh, slower growth before that analyzes. And kind of the, the, the last, the second question I have is, uh, I guess, what percentage of NDC bookings you still have currently? Is it still very small? And if I look at the broader industry, that seems to be ramping up quite massively. Uh, should we expect the same, given you've signed um, the agreement already? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's start with the, with the second one. So uh, we're seeing, as well, massive uh, increase in terms of our NDC bookings, but yes, uh, they're still on the low single digit uh, number. Uh, for us, as I think we have uh, mentioned, this is, uh, this is very much neutral uh, for us in terms of business model. It is a question of adoption. So uh, the adoption of NDC goes uh, depending on uh, what is the commercial strategy of the airline and how much they would like uh, to make uh, AD Facta or NDC more of a privileged channel. Those things change over time. Uh, we have just seen American Airlines uh, that was uh, putting a lot of emphasis on NDC adoption, and now uh, they're taking a little bit of that emphasis out, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, regarding the first question, which is the evolution between being a Q3 and Q4. Uh, so one thing you mentioned, which is Turkish Airlines, I think it is very early for us to uh, position ourselves into what is going to be uh, their approach. Uh, we have an agreement in place. Uh, we have uh, renegotiations ongoing. So I think uh, once we have reached the stage where that, those negotiations are, uh, let's say, concluded, uh, then we're going to be able to provide more color on what happens specifically uh, with Turkish. You know? Now, in terms of uh, why are we saying the Q3 is going to be softer and why Q4 is going to be stronger? So. Uh, we have just mentioned here that in Q2, the key uh, element for uh, the performance of the 3% has been June, and uh, we had uh, April and May uh, where we had 4%, but in June we had a working day difference. We had two working days less in June, and thus uh, that has created the quarter to end up uh, on the 3%. As we move into Q3, we have visibility on July. July is trending well. It is uh, slightly higher than what we had uh, in Q2 so far. So July is performing well, but not in relation to the market, but in relation to our own numbers. That's why we're insisting on this point. We have had last year 
a very strong August. So therefore, we are uh, being, uh, let's say, cautious in relation to our Q3, uh, because compared to our own performance last year, uh, we believe that Q3 is going to be softer in terms of growth than what was Q1 and Q2. But as the underlying trend, uh, as we have explained, uh, is strong, we believe that in Q4, uh, that is going to pick up because we're going to lap the domestic uh, 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 domestic bookings in our own issue, and uh, we will continue to see the traffic expansion that we have seen in Q1 and Q2. So, we, yes, we are expecting uh, growth that is going to be stronger than Q1 and Q2 in Q4. Got it. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of to Toby Og with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, and, and thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe just firstly, just on the margin uh, evolution in the second half, obviously you're indicating uh, fixed cost growth above the level seen, seen in the first half. Um, so could you just unpack sort of what's driving that faster rate of growth into the second half, and, and then also just what gives you the comfort around the guidance for the flat EBITDA margins, given that faster rate of growth? Uh, and then just, just secondly, on, on the hospitality segment, growth so far has been has been tracking at around 13 uh, percent and obviously your guidance for 2024 is for mid-teens so that would imply uh, an acceleration in the back half to hit that mid-teens rate of growth for the full year so just keen to understand whether we should be thinking about an acceleration uh, in the second half as realistic and, and what would be the drivers of that acceleration thank you let me, let me start on Paco can compliment uh, with me. I mean, the, the answer is yes. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, the customer signatures and uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, always some seasonality in terms of the implementation of customers and the underlying growth, both for hospitality and payments. Uh, so overall, yes, you're right. We keep our guidance and we feel uh, confident uh, about that based on the projections we have today. Uh, Paco, I, uh, no, I do I any color no. to the hospitality business. Yeah, and then with regards to the fixed costs, look, there are a couple of reasons. First, exactly the, the, the customers we have signed, uh, and uh, you know about Accor as an example, uh, and we are increasing some of the resources to really deliver in all the projects that we have in place. And we also have the, uh, the implementation of, uh, of um, the impact of the acquisition, uh, the biggest one being Vision Box in our running costs. But despite all these effects of increasing uh, fixed costs, uh, yeah, we feel confident about our flat EBITDA margin, uh, including cloud, uh, that by the way, we are ramping up, and of course, this is also uh, having an impact in our running costs, so the EBITDA margin uh, flat is, uh, we feel confident about that, and of course, excluding this implementation of the cloud, uh, there will be an expansion in our uh, EBITDA margin. Understood, thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Nicholas David with RWHA. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Actually, I have two. The first one is regarding North America. Actually, uh, we see uh, on an H1 basis, yes, bookings are down. But actually, it looked like in Q2, uh, uh, an interesting uh, sequential improvement uh, adjusted for seasonality. Is it a, a green shoot of the decision from American Airlines to mitigate its direct connect strategy, or is it just a, a change in the seasonality for this year compared to usual? And uh, what should we expect uh, regarding that issue? And still on North America, but more on the PB side um, and regarding uh, the Microsoft Microsoft Cross Strike turmoil, uh, should we expect um, some impact on your business uh, in Q3? And uh, it would be interesting to have your view on uh, what the situation now as you are the, at the heart of uh, the uh, airline's IT ecosystem, obviously, and you are using Microsoft, so I think you are in, bed, in good position to, to, to understand and to give us insight about what happened. And my, last, my second question is about gross margin development. You had a, a nice uh, year on your gross margin development in Q2. Could you give us a more color about uh, what drove this improvement versus Q1, which was a bit um, which was more negative? And, how do you expect it should to be uh, more looking like Q2 or more looking like, like Q1? Thank you. Let me let me try to cover uh, the last two. Uh, um, 
look, with regards to the gross margin, I mean, they are always impacts in one quarter or, or the other. And as we have said, we expect the rest of the year. Uh, I mean, these effects between quarter one and quarter two uh, are, are more or less offsetting each other. So we, will, we believe that year to date is a good uh, representation and estimation of what we expect uh, moving forward. Okay, so I will not take uh, the second quarter of uh, the first quarter as, again, there are impacts in, in the base. Uh, and the overall performance of the business is what uh, has allowed us lead to manage, uh, you know, this improvement in, in the gross margin. With regards to the crowd strike uh, impact, no, we don't expect any impact uh, to our business based on the figures. It's extremely, extremely difficult to really analyze, uh, you know, the, 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 when there is a cancellation or a movement, uh, what is the origin of that. But overall, we have not seen in our figures uh, of July any impact uh, in relation to, to this, uh, uh, what happened with crowd strike uh, to us. With regards to North America, let me start on this, as you can complement. I mean, as you know, we have the impact of Easter uh, in the second quarter, but we have also been doing well overall in North America, despite the fact that we had the, this particular impact. But this is, you can provide. Yes, in terms of visibility and the numbers, I don't think that there is any other effect. That uh, uh, There are many commercial activities that is happening and things are, are going on in the North American market, but nothing that would be visible. Visible effects uh, we, can, we insist on, Q4 where we're going to have uh, this lapping of, uh, of this very large OTA Direct Connect decision, and thus we're going to see numbers in North America changing uh, visibly uh, uh, there because, because of, of, of that lapping. All right. Thank you very much. And your next your next question comes from the line of Nunshin Nijari with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, again, on North America, I just want to understand uh, this contraction that you saw in uh, first half. Are you expecting the same for the second half? And what would it uh, take for it to go back to positive growth? And is this something that you expected uh, when you were guiding for GDS? Thank you. Look, let me start with the guidance. Yes, the answer is yes. All that has been considered in our projections. And again, as we are uh, uh, insisting, we keep our guidance for the rest of the year. Of course, it considers the current situation and, and our estimation for the second half, definitely. Yeah. Uh, in regards to North America, the way we see it, it is, it is not a, a contraction. It is a continuation of uh, three quarters uh, of, uh, of an effect uh, that started in Q4-23. So we'll see that lapping in Q4-24. Uh, and uh, we go back to the underlying. So if we exclude uh, the effect uh, of uh, that direct connect, uh, we have seen a positive evolution in North America. Uh, so, uh, so we're saying uh, once that effect uh, is gone in Q4 and has lapsed, uh, we're going to see positive, uh, positive growth in Q4. Thank you. And that is all the questions that we have at this time. I would like to turn it back to Luis Marotto for closing remarks. So thanks again uh, for joining us uh, and uh, your questions and looking forward to talk for the third quarter results. And uh, in the meantime, uh, have a good uh, summer uh, period, the ones that are taking now holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you, presenters. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect.